Uh, let me thank the real organizers <laughs> who, who showed leadership and I think uh, I would really have liked to say that I enjoyed this conference greatly but as you have seen I haven't been here all week, uh, it's mainly my loss. Uh, and I hope everybody else uh, enjoyed this week uh, better. And uh, uh, Asaf, 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 cops. Uh, no, at the end. But are they okay? Okay. <laughs> so um, I'm uh, going to try and talk to you about uh, the arithmetic of density. Uh, uh, now. The general framework is uh, the sort of pendulum motion that uh, occurred in cardinal arithmetic. Kanto was expecting for many years to prove the continuum hypothesis, then the generalized continuum hypothesis, then uh, uh, it was shown to be consistent, then it was shown to the negation was shown to be consistent, and I think. Uh, expectation of set theories in, the, in 1973 was that there are no rules of cardinal arithmetic. Uh, everybody expected that after the regulars gave in, the singulars will soon also be uh, conquered and cardinal arithmetic will be lost forever. And then, and then, then Silver's theorem came and eventually people realized that there are more and more rules concerning uh, singular cardinals that uh, one could prove and one could work with. Um, okay, so before we start uh, doing density, let me uh, quickly review the things everybody knows, but maybe um, uh, some of us have forgotten. I'll do that very quickly, and then we will turn and see what do we gain by uh, switching from uh, uh, exponentiation and its uh, uh, later variant decovering to density. Okay, let's start just by the definition. <coughs> when we take two infinite cardinals, uh, I think I should do that over there and just uh, keep the whiteboard for uh, important stuff. So, wh what is cardinal exponentiation? Mu to the kappa is the cardinality of the set of all functions from kappa to mu. Some books write it like that. And it's really two different functions, right? Uh, this is the set of functions from kappa to, to mu. If kappa is greater or equal than mu, then uh, mu to the kappa is just the, the number of subsets of kappa, right? To the kappa. So if you, if you view... Uh, Cardinal exponentiation is, uh, you know, this is mu, this is kappa. So above here, uh, above the diagonal, this is just the power set, the number of subsets. Now, if if kappa is smaller than mu, kappa is smaller than mu, uh, then this this number is uh, the number of kappa subsets of mu, it's kappa subsets of mu. Now, I, it takes a, a tiny argument. If you look at the rectangle, uh, mu times kappa, and then uh, the functions from kappa to mu are a particular type of sets lying horizontally, intersecting each fiber by one point. So their number does not exceed the total number of kappa subsets of the rectangle, but the rectangle is mu times kappa, so it's mu again. Okay, so it's the number of uh, kappa subsets. Uh, so it's actually two different functions. When kappa is equal to mu, they coincide. Uh, what do I want to say? Uh, I'm not sure. I, did I ever know? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, now, uh, the Gimmel function, Gimmel of mu, is a particular uh, 
case of exponentiation is just mu to the cofinality of mu. So if, if mu is regular, this is just 2 to the mu. If mu is singular, uh, then this is the number of uh, small subsets of mu, of uh, the size cofinality of mu. And uh, I don't know if, Menachem, do you know who proved that Gimel determines exponentiation? It's First of all, it's Bukowski. Bukowski. So it's enough to know the critical values of, of uh, uh, exponentiation in the second version, okay? If you know that, then uh, you know all exponentiations. And now just as a warm-up, let's look at the function uh, x goes to x to the kappa. So the first jump, let's start at kappa, kappa to the kappa, which is just 2 to the kappa. So as we all know, for kappa aleph 0, this is unbounded. We cannot uh, bound the size of 2 to the kappa using the enumeration of the cardinals, using the aleph functions. So in here, between kappa and kappa to the kappa, you could have as many cardinals as you want. Now, starting at the successor, uh, you have something that some books call the Hausdorff formula, the number of kappa subsets of a regular larger than kappa, uh, not the number, but all kappa subsets of a regular with a larger cofinality are bounded. They, they're not, so a simple induction shows that this uh, function is identity for a while until it hits the first limit uh, of cofinality kappa, and then there is another jump. Now, some good sign was <laughs> when it was ob observed by uh, Shellach, by Sauron, that if you say if kappa is aleph zero, although the first jump is unbounded, the second one is bounded. So this is less than omega four cardinals. Okay. And then again, after the second jump, again you have identity for a while and another jump, identity and jump. And but this hope is soon shattered because for eventual regularity, once you get to the first fixed point, mu is the first fixed point, say, and, and a strong limit, then it's aleph zero power is not bounded. This is Moti from a couple of years ago, Moti Gittig, uh, that showed that you cannot uh, get a bound on the power of uh, the first fixed point. Now, another thing that is worth uh, mentioning is that uh, mu to the kappa is the covering number of, of kappa sets times 2 to the kappa. So for all values after that, it's really a covering number. And uh, that's why you can handle it with PCF uh, machinery and, and bound it in some cases. Okay. Covering number is the cofinality mu subset of size kappa with <coughs> with the subset relation. Okay, now I'm getting to the point where I cannot read my own handwriting, so I'll have to improvise. Uh, now, uh, an important uh, uh, I want to put something here. I wanted to put here a formulation of the GCH. So let's put the formulation of the GCH. Uh, it's not the standard one, the standard one, because I, I will only be interested in uh, mu to the kappa for small kappa. So let's have this formulation: mu to the kappa for kappa smaller than mu is. Uh, mu plus if kappa is greater or equal than the cofinality of mu and mu otherwise. Okay, this is a, a consequence of the GCH. So let's call it the GCH. Since I'm already at the whiteboard, the singular cardinal hypothesis, uh, let's uh, say that 
the covering number of mu cofinality mu is mu plus for all singulars mu. I mean, this is really what it's about. I mean, the singular cardinal hypothesis is many times uh, expressed as a conditional, if it's a strong limit or if something else, but there's no need for that. This is what it says. Okay, so these are two of the statements we will want to carry over to density. And what else? Yes. And now we reach the point that we need to go, if we want to get eventual regularity, go be beyond covering. And uh, this is where uh, the revised uh, GCH occurred. Uh, mu to the kappa is uh, the minimum of the cardinality of a collection F. F contained in mu to the kappa. And for all x in the kappa subset of, of mu, there is a small collection, hmm, y in f less than kappa such that x is in the union of y. Each kappa subset is covered by few, a union of a smaller number, smaller than kappa, fewer than kappa uh, members of the collection. Now, uh, the revised GC8 says that this function is behaving very nicely, uh, uh, asymptotically, CH, uh, for all strong limit mu, for all larger lambda, uh, uh, for all but boundedly many kappa below mu, uh, lambda to kappa assumes its minimal value. Okay? Now, it's a different type of, uh, it's a horse of a different color. You, you, you cannot say it alone for a single exponent, but you have, okay, let's be very concrete. Take bet omega, okay, assume you see h up to aleph omega, take aleph omega. So if just aleph zero many regular cardinals in the place of kappa. All sufficient, each sufficiently large cardinal uh, assumes a minimal value with respect to weak covering with almost all of them. But of course, for each of them separately, you can find a singular of the appropriate cofinality, uh, which fails. Okay. Uh, now, okay, let's define density and see uh, uh, what extra mileage we can get by working with density instead of, say, weak covering. So uh, definition, uh, OK, uh, definition, OK. A kappa is always smaller than mu, uh, smaller or equal than mu. The kappa density of mu is, okay, let me save on notation, the cofinality of mu kappa with inverse uh, containment. It's the dual of covering. It's If you take the partially ordered set, then this is indeed density. The least size of a family of kappa sets such that each kappa set contains one from your collection. Okay? The downward density. Uh, okay. Um, you, could, you could throw in more parameters. You could put your kappa 1, kappa 2, this number of kappa 1 sets, which are dense in the kappa 2 sets, but let's not do it today. Um, 
here's the first important gain or, or difference that we get once we work with, with density. Uh, D mu kappa is not, I hope this is clear enough, not monotone in kappa. Okay, here is an example. You take beta omega. So uh, maybe it's, okay. I want to say two things at once, so maybe I'll start with one of them. Uh, let's start with the example and then analyze it. Let's take beta omega and take the density of beta omega with all of one. Uh, what is this? Look, to cover I need to know the whole set, but to be dense I just need to, to get a, a large part of it. If you take an Aleph 1 subset of beta omega, uh, in some bounded part it will have uh, cardinality Aleph 1. I, maybe not the whole set, but I'll have a full chunk of it at some bounded part. And in the bounded part I have uh, the cardinality of all Aleph 1 sets. Is, uh, so this is, is it clear that this is beta omega? Good. I'm happy. And uh, this is less than the density of beta omega aleph zero. Because the same diagonalization that you do uh, in proving Koenig's lemma give you actually, gives you actually a pair an almost disjoint collection of aleph zero, unbounded aleph zero sets, right? If you have beta omega of them, you can just diagonalize and get another one. Aleph 1, Aleph 0, small and big. This does not happen with exponentiation. If you have many Aleph 0 sets, you have also many Aleph 1 sets. Okay? So, and, now, and here's the other thing that I wanted to say, and uh, would have explained this faster. Uh, the density of mu kappa is the lower density mu kappa plus the upper density mu kappa, where, let's start with this, this is the uh, supremum of densities of bounded ordinals, I mean what you can do on bounded set, and this is the density of the collection of a cofinal kappa sets in mu. Now, if the cofinality of kappa and mu is not the same, this, this is a, the empty collection. So, the Hausdorff formula for density works better here. You don't need to, uh, to, to, to recall what happened in smaller cardinals. So let me give another example. Take uh, mu of cofinality aleph zero, strong limit and extremely big uh, mu to the aleph zero. Okay, so the density, we'll see in a minute, the density of aleph zero sets of mu is, is very big. And Go to the first uh, singular of cofinality Aleph 1. Uh, sorry. What, what the Aleph, if this is strong limit, the Aleph 1 density here is still small, is the identity function, and persists until the first limit of cofinality Aleph 1. So this is the first limit in the gap of cofinality Aleph 1. What is the Aleph 2 density of this up, Aleph 2? Yes? Not all at once, please. What is the Aleph 2? This is strong limit. What is the Aleph density? Okay, what is the Aleph 2 density here? Okay, cofinality of mu. There are no unbound, there are no cofinal sets of order type Aleph 2 here. So uh, density here is, uh, is mu 0. By Hausdorff's formula, whatever you want, it persists all the way here. It's still mu 1 here. Okay? 
the Aleph 1 density here jumps, but not the Aleph 2 density. Now, what happens to covering at mu 1? Uh, the covering of mu 1, Aleph 1, is smaller or equal than the covering of mu 1, Aleph 2, uh, times the covering of Aleph 2, Aleph 1, which is Aleph 2. So covering has this weak transitivity. It's not as bad as with, uh, okay, maybe I'm going too fast. Take Aleph 2. The initial segments of Aleph 2 is a collection of Aleph 2 subsets, each of cardinality Aleph 1, and they cover all Aleph 1 sets. Okay? If I manage to cover all Aleph 2 subsets of some cardinal, then inside each of them I can cover Aleph 1 subsets by, al by additional Aleph 2, many. So just by transitivity, so this is transitivity. The Aleph uh, uh, 2 covering of mu 1 will jump, but the density will not. Okay, so it, density is more stable than covering. And above 2 to the kappa, also weak covering dominates density because if you have a collection of kappa subsets, you can close it under kappa subsets for kappa regular. And if you uh, have any uh, set of size kappa and it's covered by a collection of fewer than kappa sets, then one of them is going to intersect it by a big set. And you have closed down, so you have the intersection. Okay, so let's go back here. Okay, may, should I say that again? If, if you have weak covering, you have kappa, aleph 1, and you have a collection of aleph 1 sets, such that each aleph 1 set is covered by countably many of them. So take your favorite aleph 1 set and cover it by a union of aleph zero many of your sets from one of them intersects your set by a set of full size so if you close it down then which you can do if you're above two to the aleph one then you have a dense collection so uh now let's uh, use the technology of the board and uh replace all the c's by d's for density and so the generalized density hypothesis would be uh, the density of kappa subset of mu is uh, mu plus if cofinality kappa if kappa is equal or maybe I should say if cofinality of kappa is equal to the cofinality of mu and mu otherwise. So look, I, it's, n it's now, it doesn't matter if it's bigger or smaller, just not the same. Uh, what would be the singular density hypothesis that would just mean the density of mu, cofinality mu is mu plus for singular mu and here you just uh, we already said that you can you can replace weak covering by density so certainly you you you, you get that for almost all regular cardinals be not below mu uh, the density of mu kappa uh, but sorry okay. lambda kappa Lambda kappa is lambda. Okay, so we have all that. And uh, we'll have more in a minute, but uh, let's now uh, pause for applications um, and see that. So I, I'm interested in the properties of density for that reason that I want to find arithmetic functions which behave nicely from some point onwards. But it's also useful for uh, combinatorial uh, combinatorial arguments, and uh, let me sketch one. So uh, 
Uh, here's a theorem of uh, uh, Erdős and Heino. Be careful with that, that's not a German umlaut, especially if there are Hungarians in the audience. Don't mistake uh, the, this Erdős and Heino. They prove that if uh, a graph G, can I write G? Think. If, if G is K N omega 1 free, does not contain a copy of the bipartite graph N omega 1 for some N, then the coloring number of G is, is aleph zero. So I don't define coloring number. I have the privilege of being at the end. So I will just say that Peter uh, Peter defined it. Okay, that you can well order the graph such that each uh, vertex will look back to uh, finally me. Now, using the GCH, they proved that. Uh, in fact, you know, if if uh, it, it doesn't have to be omega one for all cardinal u, infinite cardinal u, if there exists n such that this is uh, mu plus free, then it's mu. Uh, the coloring number is at most mu. Now, using the GCH, they managed to jack up n to infi an infinite cardinal. And then it worked for mu, which were at least, uh, OK, GCH, uh, if uh, G is K uh, kappa um, mu plus free, no uh, large infinite uh, bipartite graphs, then um, the coloring number of G is at most uh, mu plus plus. And uh, hmm? no, with the GCH. Yeah. Now, uh, maybe I shouldn't have read. Now, if you look, there's something wrong in the analogy because this is omega 1, right? This is aleph 0 plus for the first one. The relation between aleph 0 and n is not double successor. It's an inaccessible or strong limit above it. Now, using density, you can, you can prove uh, uh, just in ZFC, uh, for all kappa and for all rho, which is at least beta omega of kappa, which is the analog of aleph zero for n, beta omega of kappa is like the next infinite cardinal above it. Uh, if any g is uh, k mm, kappa rho plus Three, then its coloring number uh, of G is at most row. Now, how do you do that? Okay, let me just wave my hands. You can do it by induction, and then you want to get to present the set of vertices of the graph as a well-ordered union of blocks, each of smaller cardinalities. So that vertices in each block have fewer neighbors in the previous blocks. OK. Can we find uh, such a, a filtration? Uh, yes. If, uh, if you have uh, a set and a vertex outside, if it has too many neighbors in, in the set, then just throw it in. OK. If you don't have large bipartite graphs, then sets of size kappa will absorb inside. You just take the common neighbors of all of them. They, they will draw inside a small number 
of, of vertices and, and give you the closure you want. And this looks promising at first, okay? This is exactly like this column Levenheim argument, okay? You take uh, all kappa subsets and to each of them you join all the common neighbors and you repeat it. After kappa plus steps, you're done. Lovely. And this goes on for omega many steps. Each application just gives you a small number of columns. But after omega many steps, the number of arguments, the number of kappa sets you have to apply the closure to grows. I mean, we forget how easy and useful it is to use this column Levenheim theorem. This is because for every infinite cardinal, the number of finite sets is the cardinal. So the arguments you plug into your functions are no bigger than the kernel. But here, this is not the case. In every limit, it will jump. But you can use a dense collection. You don't have to, to apply your operation to all of them. You, you can use a dense collection, and if density is small, you will get your filtration and use induction. This is more or less the proof of the theorem. And... Uh, the bet omega is just uh, the price for using the revised GCH theorem. Now, recently, I mean, okay, do you actually need bet omega? It's still open, but what uh, Sauron has proved last year was that uh, you will not be able to improve the graph theoretic uh, uh, theorem without making progress actually on the revised GCH. So there's no graph theoretic argument that circumvents the, the revised GCH. Okay, so this is one one application. Uh, should we do more? Do when do I need to stop? Where is my chairman? Ah, okay, that's that's good. So we'll do another application, and uh, ah, yeah, I forgot. I. I I verified just now that you did see the um, definition of, uh, of list chromatic number. So if the list chromatic number of a graph is small, it does not contain large bipartite graph, and therefore by this also the coloring number is small. And this provides a link uh, bound on the coloring number in terms of the list chromatic number. Uh, to pay my dues to the theme uh, of, of, of this conference. If you have a huge graph and uh, every graph, subgraph of cardinality, say kappa plus, has coloring number uh, at most kappa, then the whole graph has coloring number at most bet omega of kappa. Right? Because the bipartite graph kappa plus kappa plus has large coloring number. Right? So if every subgraph of Carnati kappa plus has coloring number kappa, it is uh, K kappa kappa free and then applies it here. So this is uh, my uh, modest uh, contribution to the theme of reflection and compactness. Now let's, let's move on. Uh, the other uh, application which I want to mention is a, a, a very nice theorem by Peter Komiak about comparing uh, families of sets. Now, uh, if you have a family, let's start from a family of countable set. A alpha is alpha zero. Um, Menachem used the, uh, uh, the term uh, di to disjointify the family, but I think in, in most of most of the literature is to split the family. Uh, do you call it otherwise? No, to, to, okay. So the family is essentially disjoint. If you can remove from each A a finite set for all alpha exists C alpha in A alpha finite such that A alpha minus C alpha 
alpha less than the kind of family. Uh, is pairwise disjoint? Now, to, to assign such sets means to, it's called to split the family. Okay. Now, um, here is a question that uh, Peter was addressing. You take a family and you've erased the information. Uh, you take an almost disjoint family. Uh, suppose F is almost disjoint. Countable sets, pairwise intersections are finite. Now, let's forget everything. Let's just remember the cardinality of A alpha intersection A, A beta. We don't know what is the set. Just let's just write the matrix of all intersections. Is the property of being splittable, being essentially disjoint, a property only of the matrix of... of uh, Cardinalities, or uh, could you have two families which are similar, but I mean, it's not hard to suspect that. I mean, think about this. Okay, uh, and and more there, but the intersection of any two say uh, they have the same intersection. But this is one example, and this is. Another. Th these intersect this guy all in the same finite set, and these co the intersection cover it. So it's it's not clear that you could do. It. So the theorem is that yes, it's uh, it's it's true. Uh, in fact, if you have uh, uh, so that's a theorem by Komiat. Suppose fa uh, F is almost disjoint. F1, F2 are almost disjoint. Uh, uh, F1 is A alpha. Same cardinal. F2 is made of B alphas. You can see that I planned ahead. I put C there because I want to use B here. Alpha is less than lambda. They're both uh, families of countable sets. Uh, and A alpha intersection A beta is at most B alpha intersection B beta. Then what if F2 is essentially disjoint. Also, F1 is essentially disjoint. Great. Can we push it to larger cardinals? I mean, you can push it to larger cardinals, leaving uh, the sizes of the intersection finite. But that, if, if this, this each set is very, very big, it looks actually quite ridiculous to assume that the pairwise intersections are finite. Okay, so here too, you can take this analogy, kappa is like n, and beta omega is like the next infinity above it, and you can reprove this comparison theorem using density. I should say, it applies, implies, uh, that uh, if there is a uniform bound on the uh, intersection, then the family is essentially disjoint. You see why? Because you can take a delta system and take any other family, and now they, by the comparison c theorem, by the delta system is certainly just remove the kernel and be, it, it pairwise disjoint. And uh, any other family in which all pairwise intersections have size at most n is also uh, uh, essentially disjoint. So it's a stronger than previous theorem by other authors. And this also can be done for um, uh, a, a uniform family, the, the family all of whose members have some cardinality rho greater or equal than beta omega, and the pairwise intersection are some kappa smaller than beta omega. The same comparison theorem works and needs another 
twist on density. Okay, so that's enough applications. Now uh, let's go back to uh, arithmetic. Uh, the next theorem I want to uh, state is uh, density satisfies Silver's theorem. So how will it go? Uh, suppose uh, kappa is less than theta, both regular uh, cofinality of mu is theta. Uh, the lower density of mu theta is at most mu plus. This is uh, necessary condition for what I'm about to say. And the set of all mu prime, mu prime less than mu, cofinality of mu prime is kappa, and the density of mu prime kappa is mu prime plus the set is stationary, then the density, uh, the theta density of mu is mu plus. Okay, then density mu theta is mu plus. I mean, it cannot be less by diagonalization. Density is at most lower density, that's why you have it there. But l please observe that I'm not assuming it is a strong limit. I don't need to, okay? And the proof goes pretty much along the lines of the standard proof. Baumgartner and Prickery and also Jensen discovered shortly after uh, the ultra product proof uh, of silver that actually was a modification of a proof uh, by Menachem Megiddo uh, shortly before silver uh, uh, um, eliminated the assumption of uh, a precipitous idea, uh, ideal on omega-1. Okay, so uh, you have a silver theorem. Let me just, you have to, to tweak a bit the proof. You need to bound, uh, the, the usual one, you reconstruct an unbounded set by some bounded information. Here you have to do it not from all of the bounded information, but just from a dense collection of the bounded, in, a dense subs uh, a large subset of it. So you need to reconstruct not all of the sets, but uh, uh, an anti-chain, and, and this is enough. Okay, it's it's not hard to, to follow. Also, the more general version with gamma successors for gamma less than, uh, than kappa, that also works. And now let's uh, let's prove something else. Uh, and using uh, Silver's theorem, you can prove that an implication that for exponentiation is not correct. The singular cardinal hypothesis can hold, and the GCH can fail. That's, I mean, in all Eastern models, the singular cardinal hypothesis continues to hold. I mean, if you started, say, over a ground model uh, satisfying the GCH. With density, this is not the case. If you have the singular density hypothesis from some point on, you also have no, if, yeah, you also have the generalized density hypothesis, eventually. Okay, let's phrase the theorem, if I find it in my notes. Uh, I think it should be here. Yes, we had silver. General version. Yeah. Okay. 
So l let's write this here. Here. So kappa is regular. Uh, suppose that for all sufficiently large mu with, I mean, uh, from some point on, sufficiently large mu, uh, if the cofinality of mu is uh, kappa, uh, then the density mu kappa is mu plus. That is, the singular density hypothesis holds eventually at cofinality at cof kappa. Okay, this is what it says. From some point on, all singulars of cofinality kappa assume the least um, possible uh, value of density. Then you have a version of uh, the singular density hypothesis, you'll have all uh, densities will assume their minimal um, mi minimal values for sufficient for kappas or I don't know for thetas of sufficiently large cofinality. Then, uh, for all theta such that a cofinality of theta is at least kappa. Uh, and for all sufficiently large, we have again mu, should I take something else, sufficiently large lambda, the density at lambda with theta is lambda if they don't have the same cofinality, If cofinality of lambda is not the cofinality of theta, and uh, it is lambda plus otherwise. Now this is th this doesn't work for uh, for covering, but it works for density. Now it takes some it, it, it takes some bookkeeping to do it for regular theta, but let's prove it for regular uh, for singular theta. <laughs> Let's prove it now for uh, for regular theta. Okay, so let's take. Uh, we have to prove that for every theta there is some uh, threshold mu of theta such that beyond it you have this equation, right? So let's take. Uh, let's start with kappa. Let's take some cardinal uh, mu such that mu to the kappa equals kappa. You can find one. Just uh, and it's sufficiently large such that uh, we're in the good zone. And now do induction. You have, um, when you pass to a successor, you, you maintain your achievements. I mean, the density of the successor is, if it, if it used to be small before, it is uh, still small because you don't have any unbounded kappa sets. When you get to a, cru a critical cofinality, you use your assumption. Okay? And when you get to a limit of a different cofinality, uh, you're still okay by the induction hypothesis. Okay? So for kappa, we are done. So let's take a larger theta. Start where you have. Uh, some mu theta sufficiently large so that the mu theta the theta is it's mu theta and at successors you don't need to pay anything and what do you do at the crucial cofinality you use silver's theorem why are you allowed to use silver's theorem because you have the induction hypothesis on on uh, on on kappa and if you work a bit harder, you also get it for singular theta if its uh, cofinality is sufficiently large. Now, this is definitely better. Uh, I don't know. Let me not uh, 
turn on the sales pitch, but this is a better deal than <laughs> with exponentiation. Uh, somehow, uh, uh, the fact that density is not monotone in the second uh, in the second variable is is very useful. Okay, um, now look. Uh, I think from here lecturing in front of the blackboard, I can offer my sincere admiration to modern computer technology that allows people from different parts of the land to communicate uh, and exchange ideas. So uh, two weeks ago, I put in the archive a paper about density, and I put uh, two questions about density. And another mathematician read it and answered it overnight, the next morning. Uh, that was motigitic. So what would we do without, uh, without computers? I mean, how, how would motigitic and I get to, to, to ever talk? OK. <laughs> so here are the questions. And the answer, uh, I, I will describe the answer. So, I'll take the. There were there were two consistency questions. One was uh, stronger than the other. So since since it's all both, I will just I will just give you the stronger the stronger one. I asked it first for two, and then for all finances. So so the question was: uh, Is the negation of the following? Uh, consistent. Uh, maybe I should still give you a promo. Uh, here is a problem. Suppose the generalized density hypothesis holds. Okay? Assume it or it holds eventually from some point on. Then for all kappa, for all sufficiently large except a bounded set of cardinal for all sufficiently large mu, one of the following two densities is going to give us mu back. Mu is the minimum between the density at mu with kappa and the density at mu with kappa plus. In fact, it, it doesn't have to be kappa and kappa plus. Any two regulars will do it, right? Because it, it can only change if it is in the critical uh, uh, cofinality and uh, the cofinality of a cardinal cannot equal two different regular cardinals at once. So I ask if you could uh, always prove that this consequence of uh, the, the revised density, uh, of the, the generalized density hypothesis hold, and then I ask an even better one. For all kappa zero, there exists a finite set F of cardinals larger than kappa zero such that eventually and some mu zero such that for all mu greater or equal than mu zero mu is the minimum of the density mu theta theta in f. If you're in the coloring number application, the splitting sets application, all this, what you need is a set of densities that one of them is equal to its minimum size. You, you always get, if you don't say here finite, you say countable, this is a consequence of, uh, of the revised density hypothesis. You can always get the countable set and cover with this equation whatever end segment you want. Now, you want to be able to begin above, not to have just a single finite set, but you want to be able to find them sufficiently high. So is the negation of this consistent? Guesses? Well, you know. The answer is yes. And, and, and here is uh, uh, Moti's uh, model. You start with the... Uh, in the 
Yes. You, to the minimum of the densities with the tetas in F in the finite set. You have a finite. Yeah, but maybe just to take off what all cardinals about something are equal. Sense, yeah. What? All cardinals about mu zero. You have y y the requirement. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, okay. Think about it this way. Uh, okay, may I should have uh, I should have said something else. Here, here is an observation thing by Heinal and independently by others. If you have uh, any cardinal mu, you can have at most finitely many values of the form mu to the theta for theta such that two to the theta is less than mu. The set of mu to the theta to the this set is always finite. Why is that? Uh, okay. Well, just imagine what is going on. Suppose you have, uh, I'm out of time? Oh, okay, okay. So uh, let me just sketch Moti's argument. You have, uh, you, you start with uh, an inaccessible uh, limit of strong cardinals and you enumerate all finite sets and to each finite set you uh, assign uh, a class, a disjoint class of, uh, a disjoint set of, of strongs. And then you do, the forcing <laughs> to show that in this uh, observation uh, every finite set can occur. That is, you you blow up, uh, you get this picture. Okay, uh, the cofinalities are uh, decreasing here, and the densities are uh, increasing there. Okay, I, I will not go more into that. Let me just say one one thing. I'm suggesting here another way to think about how to generalize theorems from finite to infinite. I mean, typically, you have something for all finite numbers. You will want to try it at aleph 0 with, say, aleph 1 or with aleph 2. But the more um, fruitful generalization could be the following. Think of kappa instead of n, then instead of infinite, over n, take beta omega of kappa, and instead of cardinality, take density. I'm not saying it's going to work every time, but it, it works in many of the times. You can just uh, rephrase your, uh, your combinatorial connection, splitting families, coloring numbers of graphs, and, and other stuff, and use, using the arithmetic and other properties of density, you have a chance of succeeding. Okay, sorry, I ran out of time. Ah, the cups, the cups. I mean, thank, thank, thank you all, the volunteers who, who took the pictures of the, the speakers. And wh where are the cups? <laughs> anyone who took video. Anyone who took a video should come here like and you. collect their cup. Yeah, we just thank uh, Menachem first. Okay. <laughs> Maybe questions? Uh, and, and let, let us thank uh, all the 